there. This is Michelle Lynn. I'm editor-in-chief of Academic EM, and we have here Celine. Wave hi, Celine. And I have uh, Dr. Martin Holzman, who we're really excited to have here on the Google Hangout with us. He's in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Karolinka's University Hospital, and we grabbed him out. He's still at work, apparently. Thank you for joining us from Stockholm, Sweden. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know what? We just heard about your landmark paper that just came out, and we were wondering if you can talk about this high-sensitivity T uh, troponin test. Exactly. I'll give you a brief uh, summary of our study. We included uh, all patients who come, came to our ED uh, during two years and had uh, at least one with, with chest pain as the chief complaint and had at least one high-sensitivity cardiac troponin uh, level measured. Our hypothesis was that if you have an unmeasurable, undetectable troponin level, you may go home directly from the, the independent of the timing of the blood sampling, uh, independent of risk uh, uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, since your uh, risk uh, within 30 days of MI is minimal. And, and actually, uh, what we found was that uh, the negative predictive value of an undetectable troponin uh, uh, at the arrival to the ED was 99.8%, uh, almost 100%, for MI within 30 days. That's great. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions about the paper, if that's okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, recently there was a couple of trials in the last couple of years that were published. One as the ADAPT trial that looked at sensitive troponins, and another one, a new improved ADP trial that looked at high sensitivity troponins. Um, and they basically indicated that it was safe to send people home. They used a, a risk uh, score of TIMI, um, and they said two or less with an EKG with no ischemic changes. So, and they did their cardiac enzymes at two hours. Um, did you do any comparisons with these trials um, to see basically if there was any differences? Actually, we did not compare uh, our trial to these two trials since uh, these two trials were uh, prospective and all uh, the patients were actually admitted for repeated measurements of troponins. So you cannot compare actually the emission rate or uh, uh, actually uh, how many patients were, were sent home. I think that's one of the strength with our study and to, to, my, to, our, to the best of our knowledge this is the first large actually descriptive study which shows what happens actually to chest pain uh, patients and uh, we know how many went home, how many were admitted, uh, etc, etc. Okay. Uh, it looks like in the literature uh, in emergency medicine, physicians tend to discharge anywhere from two day percent of patients with chest pain who subsequently have myocardial infarction. So the two questions I have to follow up for this is, how do you explain the low absolute risk of 0.17% of myocardial infarction in 30 days? And how do we know that patients who did get sent home after one troponin didn't have a subsequent MI? That's a good question. Uh, I think actually we had, uh, it's a low risk population, uh, those with unmeasurable uh, undetectable troponins, but in this group we had uh, patients with diabetes, prior MI, prior stroke, etc., etc. But I think if you have an undetectable troponin, your baseline risk is extremely low uh, for a cardiovascular event, and I think that that would lies in that high sensitivity cardiac troponin. We we also looked at cardiovascular death at 12 months, and there were only two cardiovascular deaths uh, among these 9,000 patients. So the risk is extremely low and I think that is the explanation what, what, for what we are seeing actually. And the second question, I think that that's, uh, that's we've been criticized for that. Obviously we don't know if we sent home patients with MI and I'm, I'm sure we did. Uh, but they did not come back. We had a complete follow-up at 30 days because of our national registries. Uh, if a patient went to another city and, and were hospitalized there, we would know that because it, 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 it's, a, it's a nationwide register. 
Uh, and I like to point out point 17 is, is in the group of undetectable troponins. In the two other groups, 5 to 14 and, and above 14 nanograms per liter, uh, there's 1.1 percent, 66 patients who actually were sent back, sent home and came back uh, with an MI. So, so I think it has to do uh, with baseline risk actually. Okay. Um, next question is, so I think in your study you quoted a hospitalization rate of 21 percent and you mentioned that the majority of these patients were, were younger with less, less comorbid disease, normal EKG and negative troponin. Is this a, a standard practice in, in Sweden? Is this something that we're seeing in other uh, hospitals and facilities around the world? I, I don't think our practice is any different, but uh, even even a, a senior cardiologist would admit to patient, let's say 75 years of age, male smoker, even if, if uh, he, he had chest pain for four or five hours and his EKG is normal, you would admit that patient for repeated measurements of the troponins. I do that my, myself, uh, uh, but uh, so, so that's why we had 21 percent of admissions. Now, I think this is far too high. I think we can reduce that emission in that group by 60 to 70 percent. 77 percent of these patients were sent home the same or the next day. So most, the majority, the vast majority of these admissions are completely unnecessary. Okay. Um, you kind of hinted that this was the first study that was of this size, powered this well. Are there any other studies that you're aware of, or are there any other studies in the pipeline, or is there going to be a follow-up to this study coming? I mean, there are uh, there are similar studies. Bodhi published a paper in Jack uh, 2011, which is very nice, it's similar to ours, but that was also not a real-life study in the respect that they they included every patient who came to the ED. All those patients were uh, hospitalized as well. Uh, so, and there was a paper last year in the International Journal of Cardiology by Gimenez uh, with a similar approach, but that was also a prospective study. So, uh, today I think our study is the, the first, uh, first one. Uh, obviously, we are, we are planning more studies, uh, and uh, currently we are actually looking at the 99th percentile because uh, we believe it's some um, some problematic that you have the 99th, uh, 99th percentile for troponin levels uh, uh, decided on a completely healthy uh, population, uh, which which does not resemble the population you see in the ED. Okay. So a normal a normal uh, uh, troponin level for a 80 year old. Uh, a lady with uh, prior coverage and, and prior MI will not be below 14, maybe that will be below 30 or 35 or 50. Got it. Um, are there any behind the scenes features of this study that, that readers or myself may not be aware of just from reading the publication in, in the Journal of uh, Cardiology? Not that I can think of really, so you know. <laughs> Okay, all right. All right. And, the, <laughs> and then the final question I have is, uh, so how should people interpret the results of your paper? So what's the take-home message? Well, the take-home message is actually that, that uh, we, we have one table, table four, where we actually uh, describe each and, every, each and every of these 15 patients actually did have an MI uh, despite an undetectable troponin and normal ECG. And I, I think if you look at the table, you will see that many of these patients were actually ill. Uh, they had, three of these patients had a sinus tachycardia of more than 100. One patient had, were hypertensive, etc., etc. So you need to do a clinical assessment. You cannot forget about the clinical assessment. And obviously, if you feel unsure or you, you have a high clinical suspicion of, of uh, uh, MI, you may repeat your measurement of troponins after maybe two hours. Sounds good. That's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything else that, that uh, listeners should know about? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is great. It's a lot like your study. It's kind of a, a one and done and, you know, thank you. Here's the bottom line. Um, so maybe we'll just end it there, short and sweet. And, and thank you so much for taking your time to join us in this discussion. And our, our readers, I'm sure, really appreciate this. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you very much, uh, Salim.
Bye-bye. Thank you, Martin, for doing this. Bye, guys.